With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. It was billed simply as the fight. The fight. The fight. I was six months old on March the 8th, 1971, when all the world's eyes were turned to Madison Square Gardens. It was a first, a historic evening in the world of championship boxing. Never before in boxing history had two previously undefeated champions squared off to see who would walk away with the title because, you see, the challenger that night was the greatest. Muhammad Ali, though he was undefeated, he had been stripped of his title by the Boxing Federation because of his unwillingness to register for the draft. That was the Vietnam War era. And so the defending champion that night, none other than smoking Joe Frazier. And even though Frazier would lose the rematch and the tiebreaker, that night it was all smoking Joe. A unanimous 15-round decision. You will probably never step into the boxing ring and take part in the thriller in Manila or any other fight. But the moment you trusted Christ as Savior and Lord, you are enlisted and are now engaged in the fight of your life. You say, preacher, what is that fight like? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, the book of Ephesians to date is my favorite book of the Bible. God used this little letter in my early teenage years to bring me out of the bondage of legalism and to give me a fuller understanding of the doctrine of salvation, to to shake off the shackles of work-based, man-centered theology. And it is possible that I have studied this book more than any other book in the Word of God. Last month, our memory work was also drawn from the book of Ephesians, and I reminded you then that this little letter is divided in our Bibles into six chapters. The first three are primarily doctrinal, the last three primarily practical. The first three chapters tell us how we are saved. The last three chapters tell us how a saved person is to live. And as this practical section draws to a close, Paul actually uses a phrase and says, finally... Brethren, or finally, my beloved. He gives the capstone to this entire book and practical section by telling us of a final thing that we need to know. And it is simply this when you got saved, you got involved in the fight of your life. Now, I want to preach today from verses 10, 11, and 12, but I want to take them somewhat out of order. As we begin in the 12th verse, notice with me, first of all, what I've called the scriptural clarification. The scriptural clarification. By the way, as you're memorizing Ephesians 6, 12, it may help you to know that the word against appears in this verse five different times. So if you have all five of your fingers, you can just walk your way across your hand memorizing this passage of Scripture. The first word against actually tells us what our battle is not. For we do not wrestle, here it is, against flesh and blood. Now from that one opening phrase, let me mention a couple of things. First, you and I are in an undeniable battle. I fear that there are too many Christians who have been duped by the charlatans on so-called Christian television. And we no longer believe that we need to walk by faith. We no longer believe that God miraculously heals. And far too often we no longer believe that we are in a real spiritual, undeniable battle. We have heard too many television preachers teach us that there's a demon under every rock, a devil behind every tree. And so we have begun to no longer believe that we're in a battle. We used to sing of this truth, onward Christian soldiers marching on to war. 
with the cross of Jesus going on before. Or as we sang a moment ago, stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. When I read Ephesians 6, 12, I'm reminded of the words of the great reformer Martin Luther, who wrote that still our ancient foes, not relegated to the past, but still our ancient foe, doth seek to work us woe. His craft, his power are great. And armed with cruel hate, on earth is not his equal. The clarification is very simple, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. I fear that too many Christians act as if only the first five words of that verse are in the Bible, for we do not wrestle. And the fastest way to get your hat handed to you in a battle is to not realize that you're in one. The text uses the word wrestle. The King James says, for we wrestle not. For we do not wrestle. Newer translations render that word as the word struggle, that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. The word rendered wrestle or struggle is used in the ancient world to describe face-to-face, nose-to-nose, hand-to-hand combat. It's that same way in our day wrestling. You would have, you'd be hard-pressed to find a sport or an athletic event that is any more hands-on, nose-to-nose, cheek-to-cheek than wrestling. Or as I grew up, calling it wrestling. Now, when I talk about wrestling, I mean the real stuff. Not this fake stuff that you see today on Saturday morning television. I mean the real stuff. Ivan Koloff, the Valiant Brothers, Abdullah the Butcher, Andre the Giant, Lex Luger, Dusty Rhodes, and the Nature Boy, Ric Flair. Woo! I mean, I grew up wondering, how expensive are those sunglasses? He said, I've got sunglasses that cost more than your house. And to be the man, he said, you've got to beat the man. Wrestling. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. And whether you're talking about real athletic wrestling or the wrestling of weekend television, it really is not a battle of strength or skill. Or rather, it's not a battle of strength and size, but it's one of skill and scheme. Even in television wrestling, it didn't matter that Dusty Rhodes was bigger than Ric Flair. When the nature boy got ready to put you in the figure four, you were going down. And it really doesn't matter how big, how strong, how well biblically educated you are. If you're struggling against flesh and blood, you're going to lose every time. John MacArthur commenting on this verse writes that one of the most effective strategies and therefore one of believers' greatest dangers, is I like this word, is the delusion that no seriously threatening conflict between good and evil is really raging in the invisible and supernatural realm. If the devil can convince you that you're not in a battle, you will be down on the mat, out for the count every single time. And as we enter into the fall months, may may I add at this point, this is one reason that I am not a spiritual fan of horror movies, Halloween, and haunted houses. Because at at the end of it, you will begin to think that all of this demonic and occult, all these talk of devils and demons is all just cartoons, fairy tales, and costumes. And if the devil can get you to be entertained by something, he will sucker punch you and you will be out for the count. The Bible says that the devil has some wiles, that he has some schemes, He has a playbook. The Greek word here is methodia. The devil has some methods. The word translated as wiles at the end of verse 11 was already used in this letter back in chapter 4, verse 14, where Paul called it the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting or deceitful scheming. I've come today to simply remind you that while we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, we do have a spiritual set of enemies. 
You and I, if we are saved, are in an undeniable battle. And if that's news to you, it's because you've lost sight of a second truth. You're in an undeniable battle. Secondly, you're in an unseen battle. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. That means if you can touch it with your hands, hear it with your physical ears, see it with your spiritual eyes, then it's not the real enemy. When you see a person who seems to be coming against you, listen, that person is not your enemy. Now, they may be a tool of the enemy, but the only person you can see with your eyes who's really your enemy is the man, the woman, the boy, the girl in the mirror. Now, you may be your own worst enemy, but nobody else is your real adversary. And you've got to get this clarification right. Because if you spend all your time fighting flesh and blood instead of principalities and powers and rulers and spiritual hosts of wickedness, you're going to spend all your time and all your energy fighting on the wrong battlefield. Think about Friday night football. The fastest way for you to lose a home game is if you think it's an away game and you show up at the wrong stadium. It doesn't matter how talented you are, how skilled you are, if you're fighting in the wrong arena, you're going to lose every single time. And our struggle is not against flesh and blood. This is why Paul would tell the Corinthians that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That means they are not of flesh and blood. John Phillips comments here that our enemies are not people. Satan may use people to persecute us, lie to us, cheat us, hurt us, or even kill us. But our real enemy lurks in the shadows of the unseen world, moving people as pawns on the chessboard of time. This is a very important scriptural clarification Listen to it very carefully. Your enemy is not your spouse. Your enemy is not your kids. Your enemy is not your daughter-in-law. Your enemy is not your father-in-law. You say, no, it's my mother-in-law. No, it's not her either. Your enemy is not your co-worker. Young people, boys and girls, as you go back to school this past week or this coming week, your enemy is not your classmate. Your enemy is not your teammate. Your enemy is not your fellow church member. Your enemy is not your neighbor across the fence. Your enemy is not the lady in front of you in the drop-off line trying to put her makeup on while you're trying to drop your kids off and get to work. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. This is one of many reasons the Scripture commands us to walk by faith and not by sight. Because if you're fighting the things you see, then you're not fighting the things that you can't see, and that's where the real battle is. There's a wonderful picture of this in the pages of the Old Testament in the book of 2 Kings chapter 6. The king of Syria was doing battle against the people of God, but it seemed like every time he came up with the battle plan, God's people knew exactly where the ambush was going to be. The king of Syria thought, I must have a spy in my midst. I I've got to have a double agent working in my cabinet. And so he hired some people to try to find out what the problem was. And a messenger told him, King, the problem's not in your war room. The problem is not among your inner circle of generals. But there's a man of God among the people of God. His name is Elisha. And anything that you whisper in the inner chamber of your war room, God reveals to Elisha. And he tells the army of God. You know what the king of Syria did? He said, I've got to send some special forces in. 
I don't know if they were Navy SEALs or Green Berets, but he sent in some special forces to take out the prophet Elisha. And that night, Elisha and his servant were camped out in a house. And the servant looked out the window, and all he could see were the Persian soldiers. His heart began to be filled with fear. Hey, boss, we in trouble. That's the Mike Stone translation. He said, don't worry about it. Those that are with us are more than those that are against us. That servant seemed to say, chief, you can't count too good. There's two of us. There's a whole mess of them out there. I don't know how many a mess is, but it was a bunch, more than two. And the prophet Elisha began to pray. God, would you open his eyes? That Old Testament prophet began to pray, and the servant's eyes were opened by the power of God. And he looked out, and he saw that the hillside was teeming with the host of angel armies. Elisha prayed that the servant's eyes would be open to the number of their allies. Paul prays that our eyes would be open to the number of our adversaries and says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. If you could go back to the 1300s and tell the people of Europe that the problem they were facing was in the unseen world, they would have laughed you to scorn. As the Black Plague was moving across Europe and they were stacking dead bodies up like cordwood, somebody that was healthy in the morning would be dead by nightfall. Tell them that the, all of their cleaning wasn't going to matter. All of their washing wasn't going to matter because the enemy taking them out was in the unseen world. If you know your history, it was a, it was a microscopic thing that lived inside the blood of fleas. The manifestation of the problem they could see with their eyes was caused by something they could not see. And so it is in the battle and the struggle that you and I face in the fight of our life. There's a scriptural clarification. Note with me, secondly, the specific identification. I'm just working my way through our memory verse. For the Bible says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we do have some enemies, and Paul identifies them. And we must pay close attention to this identifying statement because the devil does not show up wearing a red suit with, with pointed horns and a pitchfork announcing his intention. Any more than any bookkeeper has ever showed up for a job interview and said, I'm an embezzler and I've come to rob you blind. Could I have the job? Nobody's ever told you on a first date, I'm a womanizer, and I plan to break your heart and ruin your future. They don't show up and announce their intentions, and neither does the devil. He and this host of minions show up as angels of light. This is why most of the titles of our adversary use the language of deception. The devil is called the accuser of the brethren, the adversary, the angel of light, the deceiver, the enemy, the father of lies, a liar, a murderer, the prince of this world, prince of devils, prince of the power of the air, the serpent, Satan, the tempter, and the wicked one. But the Bible does not want us to be uninformed, ignorant soldiers in God's army. So he specifically identifies our adversaries. Note with me, first of all, who they are. There are four different layers, levels, or classifications of demonic spirits that we find recorded in this text. John Phillips, the great alliterator, says that they are dignitaries, deputies, demons, and deceivers. But I'll just use the four words or phrases that we find actually in the text. Let's identify these enemies. Note, first of all, he mentions principalities. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against 
principalities. Would you say principalities? I was pointing out to one of my children this week that when you see the word principalities, you see the word prince. It speaks of a position of leadership, of some type of royalty, of reign or rule. Students, you also see the word principal. That does not mean that the principal at your school is full of the devil. It just means that on that campus, the principal is the highest ranking faculty member at that school. This speaks of a high top rank. In fact, the Greek of the New Testament uses the participle arch, A-R-C-H, as in an arch enemy, an arch rival, or even a, a higher archy or a hierarchy. It speaks of high-ranking generals in the army of hell. Please understand this. Satan is not omnipresent. He's not just the bad version of everything that God is. He is himself a created being who operates under the umbrella of the sovereignty of God. It bothered a few people a few Sunday nights ago when I told you that the devil is a pawn in the hand of God. The devil is God's devil. And he doesn't have the power to do anything that God does not allow him to do. He is not omnipresent. Therefore, to enact his demonic will against mankind, he builds an army out of the fallen angels. And just as our army and just as the armies of heaven have rank and dominion and order, there is rank, dominion, and order in the demonic world. Ricky Baldwin calls these principalities Satan's cabinet members. You thought we had problems in our president's cabinet. (laughs) We do, by the way, but that's a whole other sermon. Principalities. There's a second group, though, that the text tells us. We wrestle against principalities and secondly against powers. Now, the Greek word here speaks of authority and power that has been delegated by virtue of a position. As I mentioned, Satan is not omnipresent. And so he enlists and installs principalities. Underneath each of them, there are powers, delegated authority in the spiritual realm. And by the way, if you think that what I'm preaching today is the stuff of the sci-fi network, you've already been hoodwinked and bamboozled by the devil. There's good news for the principalities and powers, at least as far as we're concerned, because Paul told the Colossians in Colossians 2.15 that Jesus Christ has disarmed principalities and powers at the cross. But we still fight them today. Principalities, powers, watch this next word, rulers of the darkness of this age. That word ruler speaks of those who have charge of a specific location and a geographic area. Football season is really kicking off. Uh, Some of you have worked uh, with the offensive line or the defensive line. And you know if you've got an O-lineman, on that particular play, he's got one job. And the one job for that lineman is to move that defensive lineman to the left. That's your job. Stay here, move that guy to the left. Stay here, move that guy to the right. Or fool him, step out of the way, and let him run by. We're going to run around the other way. In the very same way, Satan, if he were depicted as a coach, he is given very specific, listen, position assignments. Geographic positions. You say, I don't know if I believe that. Well, let me show it to you in your Bible. You may jot down a reference to the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 9 and into chapter 10, the prophet Daniel had a desperate need in his life, and he began to pray and intercede. He prayed, indeed, he fasted. And the answer never came. Finally, when the answer did arrive, it came by an angelic messenger 
And here's what the angel said to Daniel. God heard your prayer 21 days ago. And I was dispatched as the answer and with the answer to your prayer. But for the last 21 days, I've been doing battle. I've been hindered by the prince of Persia. Who was the angel fighting? The prince or the king of the Medo-Persian empire was a man named Cyrus. That's who the earthly prince was. But the angel said, I was trying to get the answer of God to you, but I was hindered in the spiritual realm doing battle against one of these principalities that has been assigned to the region, the geographic area of the Medo-Persian empire. Parents and grandparents, I want you to listen very carefully. If the Bible teaches, as I believe the Bible teaches, that demonic, devilish spirits have geographic posts, how should I pray differently over my home? How should I pray differently over my child's school? How would I pray differently over their automobile? How would I pray differently over their dorm room? How would I pray differently over where they recreate? Or pray over their bus before they get on the band bus or the ball team bus to head off because I believe that there are demonic spirits dispatched and assigned to this very specific place. You think demons aren't assigned to specific places? May I remind you that in the demoniac of Gadara, when Jesus asked his name, our name is Legion, for we are many. When Jesus exercised those demons, they asked to be cast into a herd of swine. Very specific place. I know this may sound like a bad Frank Peretti novel. I'm sorry, I just dated myself. But could it be that what we need to do to claim and experience some victory in certain areas of our life is to pray in the name of Jesus and ask based on the authority of the Word of God for Jesus to cast out and remove demonic spirits from various places in our own life, our own home, and our own geographic region. We wrestle against principalities, against powers, against rulers. Fourthly, he says, we wrestle against spiritual hosts of wickedness. Now, one translation simply says spiritual wickedness, but the word connotes that there are many of them, an, an almost immeasurable number of spiritual forces. So, this translation calls them spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, I did not come today to make you afraid, but I did come to make you aware. You're in the fight of your life, if you know the Lord Jesus. We see who they are. Note with me, secondly, now, where they attack. I'm talking about the specific identification. Nestled throughout this one verse, we are repeatedly reminded that it's not flesh and blood, it's not in this world, it's against the darkness of this age, and we operate, these demons operate in heavenly places. One tr- translation says, in high places. Now, the word heavenly in this text, that the, the demons work in the heavenly places, is not referencing what you and I would commonly call heaven, as in the place where God dwells, where Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father, the place where holy angels reside. The word heavenly here just speaks of the spiritual realm. And again, it's a reminder that we do not operate in the natural, in the human, or the visible. Paul is a little more specific about where this spiritual realm exists when he writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 10, starting in verse 3. 
There he writes that we walk in the flesh. That is, we, we physically live in this world. Our walk is here, but our battle's not here. He said, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, that is, they're not flesh and blood, but they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Parents, I want you to look right here. Mom and dad, grandma, grandpa, look right here. If you study 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul goes on to describe that we are to cast down imaginations, strongholds, and thoughts. Because where these demonic spirits attack, look right here, it's in the mind. They can impact the physical realm, but primarily they want to attack the mind. Jesus said, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If I can control what you think, I'll control you. Your mind, just like your tongue, is a rudder on the ship of your soul. And if I can get you to believe a lie, I can control you. This is why the devil operates in the realm of the mind. If he can get you to believe that somebody has done you wrong, even if they haven't, you'll respond and operate as if that were true. If he can convince you that God does not love you, then you'll respond as if God doesn't love you. If the devil can convince you that God will not provide for you and care for you and undergird you, then you will be filled with worry and anxiety just as if God had been toppled from his throne. Because this battle happens in the mind. It happens with philosophy, the traditions of men. This is why Paul told the Colossians, you better beware that nobody take you captive. Listen, not with chains of this world. Paul told the Colossians, beware lest anyone take you captive with philosophy. By teaching you something that's simply not true. Now what I'm about to say goes for every school in this community. It might even go for the homeschool homes represented here today. But there is within the educational structure a host of demons that are trying to take your mind captive. You may be dropping your kids off tomorrow at a battlefield. A battlefield for the mind. But they may win the battle for the soul. So parents, what are we doing? How are we praying and how are we defending against the enemies in this battle? Who they are and where they attack. You're in for the fight of your life. We see the scriptural clarification, the specific identification. Note finally, the spiritual preparation. Paul seems to blow Reveille for the readers here in the book of Ephesians and says, get out of your bunk and clothe yourself in the whole armor of God. The twelfth verse tells us why we need to do what verses 10 and 11 tell us to do. Let me say that again. Verse 12 tells us why we need to do what verses 10 and 11 tell us to do. So how do those two verses lay out a plan of spiritual preparation. For you see, if you realize you're in a battle, you will prepare for it differently. And there are two weapons that we need at our disposal. Number one, you need to have His ability in you. His ability in you. Notice back now in verse 10. Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the what? Talk to me. Be strong in the what? And in the power of who? His might. 
Earlier in this service, we sang, stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand in his strength alone. Look right here. This arm of flesh will fail you. Ye dare not trust your own. In and of yourself, you're not smart enough, educated enough, experienced enough, bold enough, courageous enough to take on the devil. Indeed, Luther said, his craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. You and I are no match for the devil standing in our own strength. So the Bible says, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. You say, preacher, doesn't the Bible say greater is He that is in me than He that is in the world? But yes, that's what I'm trying to tell you. We need Him who is in us because only He is greater than He who lives in the world. That verse is talking about the greatness of our God, not the weakness of our enemy. We have a formidable adversary, and we must stand in the strength of the Lord and in the power of His might. Some years ago, I had a sister that was going through a very nasty divorce. Now, there's no such thing as a nice, clean, polite divorce, but this one was exceptionally nasty. My then estranged, soon-to-be ex-brother-in-law was a trophy-winning bodybuilder. That's important to know in the story. Because he called her and threatened he was coming over to perform some violence against her. And I just happened to be there. I met him out in the driveway and said, if you think you're going in that house, you're going to have to get through me. He said, it won't take much. He was right. But I looked at him, I said, listen. (laughs) It'll be to do. And I wouldn't give you a plug nickel for any man that didn't feel the exact same way. I'd rather be beat to a bloody pulp in the driveway than to walk away like a coward. And there's not a man in this room that wouldn't have done the exact same thing. I don't think I deserve any award for courage. It's just being a man. And if we will understand and do that in the physical realm, how much more Sir, I'm talking to you. Should we stand in the strength of the Lord to defend our family in the fight of our life? To say, devil, you can't have my kids. You're not going to have my son. You're not going to take my little girl. You are not going to have my marriage. You are not going to steal my peace. You will not take away my joy. I've made up my mind. I've set the GPS of my soul on the King of Heaven. I've anchored my soul on the Lord Jesus Christ. You mess with me, you've got to mess with my Father. For I'm standing in the strength of the Lord and in the power of His might. And I'm going to Bible quote you back to hell where you belong. I'm going to stand right here in the strength of Almighty God. To be prepared for this battle, you've got to realize, first of all, you're not a man or a woman enough for this battle, not by yourself. You better have his ability in you. Secondly and finally, you better have his armor on you. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. that You may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, Many Bible scholars have suggested that as Paul writes this letter from prison, he was probably chained to or at least chained near a Roman guard. And perhaps he is using that guard's armor as a bit of an illustration. Now, whether that's true or not, it's a pretty clear 
notion that God has provided everything we need to live out the victory He provided for us at the cross. And in verses 13 and following, the specific pieces, the implements of that armor are listed. Now, it's beyond the scope and purpose of today's message to dissect each piece of that armor, but let me give you the armor in one word. What is the armor of God? Listen, friend, the armor of God is Jesus. We need Christ in us, the hope of glory. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's Jesus who is the helmet of our salvation. It's Jesus who is the breastplate of a righteousness without which no man shall see God. It's Jesus who is the author and finisher of faith that is our shield. It is Jesus who is the very embodiment of the the shoes of the gospel. It is Jesus who is our Prince of Peace. And it is Jesus Christ with the very word of His mouth that is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Each of these pieces of armor are beautifully fulfilled in the finished work of Jesus Christ. To be prepared for this battle, you have to have His ability in you. And you have to be in Jesus Christ, clothed in the Lord Jesus One of the most interesting stories that I've ever heard is from 2014. A man in China was killed by a decapitated cobra. Somebody had cut the cobra's head off 20 minutes before it struck this unsuspecting man. And snake experts worldwide began warning about the danger of decapitated snakes. Sean Bush, a snake expert at East Carolina University, told his local NBC affiliate that venomous snakes can wield fatal strikes up to 90 minutes after they've been decapitated. And in that interview, he said, and I quote, be careful around venomous snakes even if they look dead. Even a decapitated snake can kill you. Well, beloved, our Lord Jesus Christ went to Calvary's cross, bruised on the hill by our enemy, the serpent. But in the process, Jesus Christ, through His death, burial, and resurrection, has crushed the serpent's head. He is a defeated foe. But be careful. If you mess around with him and his minions thinking you can fight him on your own, even a decapitated snake can hurt you. You're in for the fight of your life. You say, preacher, what is that fight? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, where Pastor Mike Stone is committed to walking you verse by verse through the books of the Bible. You can contact us through our church website at ebchurch.net or visit pastormikestone.com. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of the Emmanuel Pulpit.